have also worked with the political parties there. And um, the Socialist Party is, um, was hesitating between calling for the complete withdrawal of the plan and um, negotiations. But if I was to approach your question from the point of view of this, is there a, this big disconnect between the rank and file and the masses, I would say it's very similar to here. Very, very similar to here. And one of the biggest ones is probably the left critique of the popular front. Uh, maybe I'll just say a quick uh, uh, something about that. When journalists and labor historians and labor activists and socialist, um, the socialist leadership in France and the communist leadership look back to the popular front, they do it fondly, especially now when those important social gains are under attack. But there's a left critique developed by Trotsky and others at the time that the popular fronts served as left cover to uh, prevent what could have been a much greater, much deeper, much broader working class mobilization that could have even resulted in a revolutionary situation and a transfer of power. And so one of the most famous phrases of the 1936 strikes, and it still is part of left discourse today, was when French Communist Party leader Maurice Thérèse said, il faut savoir terminer une grève, which means one must know when to end a strike when all the basic demands have been met. This was a situation in which the employers who had refused to discuss with labor organization for years and years and years rushed to sit down with them because they thought with the sit-down strikes, with two and a half million people on strike, with demonstrations throughout the country, there's a labor historian, Danielle Tartakowski, in France who has estimated that during the several years of the Popular Front, there was one demonstration in France every day somewhere for several years. So Maurice Torres is more interested in keeping the Popular Front Alliance together than he is advancing socialist revolution. So his, what he tried to do was tap down, tone down labor protest in favor of the important gains that were registered. Um, so that maybe is the largest disconnect because there could, could definitely be an argument made that French workers were prepared to go a lot further than they did in 1936. The same debate happens for 1968, and well, today we're seeing echoes of the same thing as well. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, One is uh, about your sources, the police reports. Um, having looked at uh, police reports from uh, the uh, period of uh, the anti-socialist laws in Germany during uh, the late 19th century, uh, another key source of, of, of uh, socialist history in that period, formation of social democracy. Uh, there is significant bias in those reports, uh, and there's a debate about how that bias has influenced how historians have conceived of, of uh, uh, class and cultural identity uh, within German social democracy. I'm wondering if you had the same problem with your police report sources, um, and um, were, you, were, you able to, uh, were you able to negotiate that bias? Uh, and the second question is um, the longitude of class identity from the early 20th century to I know that union uh, membership in France is relatively low, yet uh, popular protests, um, as I see them uh, in the media and on the internet, uh, do have a class component to them. Um, similar in the ways that I hear you talk about uh, the first three decades of France. What in your mind is the reason, the, the historical reason for it? What are the material uh, basis of this long-standing uh, identification among French, French masses, whether they be uh, citizens or immigrants, with this um, idea of, uh, of a class identity. Okay. Um, take another, or one or two, or maybe I'll just kind of plunge into that one. Well, you know, that's really one of the big questions here, the longevity, the production, and the reproduction of political identities. Political identities are remarkably stable. Um, I think in this country, people tend to be from a Republican family or a Democratic family, or more rarely a Socialist family. The same thing in France, and these things last for a long, long period of time. And I was thinking my stock answer here would be that um, 
it's these larger structures that maintain them. They're political structures, the availability of program, the availability of playing certain politics out. Uh, do demonstrations work? Do strikes work? Does shop floor action work? How are they connected with various different identities? Um, um, and the like. So um, what about the industrial social relations? What about the links between um, workers? Um, in, in the United States, we have deindustrialization. Our, our greatest, uh, the greatest bastions of, of uh, union strength are in industries that are now gone. They're literally, literally gone. The factories are in Mexico or elsewhere d d dismantled. Um, so I think that uh, the ruptures and the continuities um, if the arguments I make in this book work beyond France for those occupational groups, for that particular time, we want to look at political structures. We want to look, including the availability of programs, something that many of us here um, have been involved with, the organizations that we've been involved with. That's the availability of, the capacity um, um, to publicize those, um, the way they resonate with um, other forces, nationally and internationally, um, and the like. I think those still are big things that help structure um, uh, political identities. Um, as far as the police reports go, um, the police reports really were designed to be used by the authorities in order to finger, la finger labor militants. And, um, and what I did with them a lot is I used them to corroborate different types of evidence. Um, who was saying what, what was the balance of forces in what, um, in what occupational group, what political party was stronger um, than, than others. But I don't know if French historians really have many debates over the way that the reports themselves have been manipulated. Um, the French authorities like to take knowledge and build power um, about um, their suspicion of, um, today they talk about um, the secret police infiltrates anarchist groups and uh, whips up public sentiment around the notion of um, people who are in a riot and, and people at the margins of uh, demonstrations who break windows uh, and cause those type of things. And they use those to whip up um, support, uh, hysteria, against strikes and demonstrations and the like. Well, now that we're on this uh, subject of reports, I uh, brought to mind a question. Um, you know, recently, I don't know, maybe some people have read this, and I, I don't recall where I saw this, but um, one of the things that was made note of was in the United States and like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, apparently um, after Reagan took office back in 1981, um, he immediately saw to it that uh, they were going to change the way they defined unemployment in the United States. And essentially what it boiled down to was the change that was made was that, you know, currently, the system, and this is what we've been operating on since 1981, again, since Reagan made this change, was part-time employment. Prior to uh, 1981, if you were, um, basically, the change was that workers who would be considered unemployed by virtue of the fact that they were part-time employed were, from, that, from 1981 forward, considered employed workers. Now, that would take us to today and also discourage workers, that is to say people that have given up looking for a job. So we're at this figure now in the U.S. it's like 9.6, 9.7%, those are the numbers that have been given. If they use the old Bureau of Labor Statistics standards, that number would jump to, incredibly enough, 22.5% because there are so many other people that have, of course, they're not registered with their state employment services and They've given up looking, et cetera, et cetera. Or they may have three jobs. You know, I work a day here and half a day there, that sort of thing. But anyway, getting to the question of France, I don't want to, um, the numbers that I saw recently with regards to France were quite similar, actually, to the United States, at least the numbers that they're using. It was slightly less. I believe it was like around 9.4 or 9.5%. So I was wondering, you know, if you could uh, try to contextualize this, if you will, the circumstances that exist.